we go. And to Dr. Schnickel for Physician of the Year. Yeah. Now, I know what you're thinking. These are just internal, just Department of Surgery awards, but they're not. Actually, these are institution-wide. They are individuals who are nominated on and then voted on by you know, the med staff. And so this is really a recognition of not just your great internal sort of care within the Department of Surgery, but your ability to extend out and really be helpful to folks outside of our own little silo. So this really is truly a remarkable recognition. I don't know why Department of Surgery people don't win it every year anyway. I mean, we probably should, but this is really uh, amazing and a reflection of the outstanding house staff in general and the outstanding faculty in general. And again, I just wanna thank both Hannah and uh, Gabe for that. So Dr. Descent. Well, thanks, Dr. Clary. And it's uh, exciting um, to introduce for the first time um, since the uh, onset of the pandemic, a visiting speaker actually who's physically here. And so, um, and that is uh, Dr. Jeff Kirby. And so uh, Dr. Kirby is a native of Missouri from Lancaster, Missouri, which sounds like it's almost in Iowa. So uh, very North, but um, he is um, uh a well-known uh, trauma surgeon. He's a true triple threat, a researcher, a, a great clinician, and uh, a teacher as well. He um, went to university uh, first at uh, University of, Mar of Missouri in, uh, in Kansas City, did his undergraduate and medical degree there. And then he went to the University of Alabama in Birmingham to do his uh, residency. He also did his PhD there in uh, molecular biology and um, then went on to also do uh, complete his residency and his fellowship. They must have liked you because they kept you. Um, and uh, after he also was in the U.S. Air Force uh, and served actually pretty contemporaneously with myself, I was in the Royal Canadian Air Force, and we must have been very close to the same in Afghanistan at the same time um, during Operation During Freedom. He was there in 2002, and I was there a little bit later. Uh, he went back to UAB in 2003, and there um, he was an acute care surgeon and eventually became the trauma medical director. Um, he has been well known for uh, his uh, uh, background in research. He was the uh, Alabama head of the Research Outcomes Consortium. He's had uh, over uh, 170 papers in, uh, in clinical and basic science uh, involved with uh, trauma, transfusion, resuscitation. Um, multiple trials. He's um, and currently uh, leading several trials, including some that were involved with uh, looking particularly at pre-hospital care resuscitation and uh, transfusion and uh, management of uh, coagulation. Um, at UAB, uh, much as we're trying to do here at UCSD, he's been involved with trying to increase military civilian uh, partnerships and training. And uh, he's been training 18 Deltas, which are medics for the Army, as well as uh, uh, medics for the Air Force. Uh, he's also been training um, special operations uh, force surgeons for the U.S. Air Force as well. And so a um, person who's very well qualified. I first met uh, Jeff as the chair of the membership committee of the Committee on Trauma. And um, right away, I noticed that he was a, a, an outstanding uh, leader in that position. Not only a great uh, surgeon, but also one who was uh, a great uh, uh, personality and able to, uh, you know, communicate with anybody, able to uh, put people at ease and, and basically uh, lead a crew. Um, surgeons can have sometimes been accused of being slightly egotistical, and you can imagine on an organization, the Committee of Trauma, which is composed of a hundred of the, the most leading surgeons in the United States, um, who gets to do what can be a contentious issue. <laughs> and uh, and so uh, Dr. Kirby was masterful in, in able to uh, manage the expectations of a lot of people in that organization. I think that is why, uh, one of the reasons why last year he was selected the, the chair of the Committee of Trauma. The Committee of Trauma of the American College of Surgeons is something that will affect all of us in some way, that at the very least you have to have an ATLS course to uh, complete your residency, but it, it's involved with us in a lot of different ways. You know, the... Um, one of the original successful trauma registries, disease registries, was the trauma registries, uh, which go all the way back to the mid-80s, and the uh, COT was involved with that. Um, verification of trauma centers, that's something that uh, you have to deal with uh, as a surgeon. 
um, a lot of educational things, not just ATLS, but a lot of other courses that we take um, in the course of our residency and, and uh, attending hood as well. And so it's a very influential uh, organization. It's, I think, probably the, the largest, most dynamic part of the, of the American College of Surgeons because of the amount of work that it does and uh, all the accomplishments that, that have turned out to be a model. Um, the quality model that the American College of Surgeons uses now with all the different all the different quips out there from this quip to uh, all the other quips including T quip and M MBA quip and all the other quips that's all been part of the uh, I'll start with the committee of trauma so so that's it, it's a very very exciting to have him here um, he's going to talk to you about the um, strategic direction of the committee of trauma which is uh, important because even if you're not a trauma surgeon you know the direction that the committee of trauma takes and its objectives will be reflected uh, in all the all the activities of the, the American College of Surgeons. So it's my great pleasure to introduce to you a, a, a great surgeon and a clinician and academic, and I know he's going to give you a great talk. So Dr. Jeff Kirby. Thank you very much. Well, after that introduction, it's all downhill from here. Uh, <laughs> thank you very much, Jay for the uh, opportunity to come here uh, to sunny San Diego. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's, uh, I mean, San Diego really has been at the epicenter of trauma advancements in, in care for decades. And uh, so to be here, it's a, it's a great honor to be here. And, and that legacy is continuing under Dr. Doucette's leadership and the, and the amazingly talented faculty that you've assembled. Uh, here, so wonderful to be here. I'm going to give a talk about the Committee on Trauma. Uh, being the chair of the Committee on Trauma is probably one of the best non-paid volunteer full-time jobs you'll ever have. Uh, so uh, I hope to. I'm fortunate to have a chair back at home and a faculty back at home that understand that and and allow me to keep my paying job. Uh, in addition to this, so uh, so really really honored to to be able to have that role. Uh, I, I want to give you an update on where, you know, some of the programs that the Capineal Trauma does. Um, some of those you'll recognize that you've probably taken ATLS courses, Dr. Doucette has mentioned. Uh, some of the work we've done in quality actually uh, was at the tip of the spear in the college. Uh, there's some great stories about how we had to convince the college that this was a good thing to do. Uh, so uh, some, some very, I'll try to get into that a little bit and tell, tell a few stories along the way, and hopefully this will be entertaining. Those are my, uh, the, my Twitter account. And the College uh, Committee on Trauma Twitter account, I have to admit, I'm not the most exciting follow on Twitter. So, but it's there in case you want it. I sometimes tweet about uh, certain things uh, related to the Committee on Trauma. I don't have any disclosures uh, uh, that I know of uh, to, uh, to uh, tell you about in relation to this talk. My objective is really to give a brief overview of the history. It's a hundred year history. I won't go over all the hundred year history of this Committee on Trauma. I'll try to just hit some highlights talk about how we were formed and then, and then that, that kind of leads into the structure of the, of the Committee on Trauma and, and, and how we're structured and how the different programs fall under that structure uh, within the committee. We're really a committee of committees. Uh, the Committee on Trauma probably has, I don't know, I want to tell you that that's day probably a hundred different committees under the Committee on Trauma uh, throughout the world. Uh, so it's a, it's a very uh, uh, robust uh, structure that we have. And then talk about some of the, the current programs that we have, some of the scope of the current programs that we have. Uh, I was uh, amazed at some of the, the, the numbers of, of centers that are verified, that are, that are uh, uh, involved with our quality programs at the college, that the number of education courses we do throughout the world. Uh, so I just want to share that with you, just so you have some idea of the scope of what we do. And then really look to the future. Our key priorities moving forward, I'm just going to focus on one. And that's the development of a national trauma system. National trauma and emergency preparedness system is something we have. You'll, you'll hear some common themes throughout this. We have islands of excellence like San Diego. It's one of the first uh, areas to really form a unified trauma system. It's a gold standard, I think. Uh, so we have these islands of, of excellence, uh, but it's amidst a sea of chaos, right? There's a lot of gaps uh, in our trauma care system across the country. Uh, and was, you know, we have all these great programs, the COT, directs all these great programs, but if patients can't access those programs, can't access those center that care uh, that we've uh, developed, uh, then we're not doing, we're not doing a, a total job. So we really need to focus on developing a national trauma system. This has been an aspirational goal of the COT uh, for over 40 years. I'll show some slides. And Don Trunke was talking about this at back in 1983, 40 years ago, about the need for a national trauma system. Brent Eastman, 
uh, who was intricately involved uh, from San Diego in, in, the, in the San Diego trauma system development, uh, talks about this. And he really was uh, one, when he was chair of the Committee on Trauma, pushing trauma systems. And that was 30 years ago. And we really still are uh, needed to make progress in this area. So we didn't start off as a Committee on Trauma. We were a Committee on Fractures. Uh, so this is our, our founding chairman, Charles Scudder, two pictures of him. Uh, one, the traditional uh, top photo of him, probably when he was a younger man, he was about 35, 40 years old in that picture. But when he founded the Committee on Trauma, uh, Committee on Fractures in the American College of Surgeons, he was 62 years old. So that lower picture is probably more representative of what he looked like when he founded the Committee on Fractures in 1922. He went to the college with a problem. There's a lot of variability in care and approach to fracture management back in 1922, and there were poor outcomes in 1922. So uh, he went to the college, said, hey, there's this problem. And guess what the college told him? Why don't you fix it? So he got, he got the job. He said, they said, uh, form a committee uh, and start addressing the issue, which is what he did. And the brilliant thing about what he did was he, he really was intentional about the original members of the committee on, on fractures that he formed. Uh, he was intentional about having a, a, a geographical diversity among the members because what he wanted to do was set up a regional structure. He wanted this central committee uh, to, to sort of uh, uh, be the, uh, uh, come up with the, uh, you know, the care of, the, of, of orthopedic injuries. And then he wanted to push out that, uh, those, uh, that those treatment algorithms and, and the way we approach uh, fractures out to these regional committees. And he also wanted the regional committees to be an incubator for ideas to bring back to the Committee on Trauma for, for, uh, for consideration that could then be pushed out. So we've had, we've had this um, regional structure. We, we eventually became a Committee on Trauma in 1949. Uh, Birmingham, Alabama was one of the sites. Uh, Lloyd Nolan was one of the, uh, one of the surgeons on the original uh, Committee on Trauma. I used to rotate in Lloyd Nolan Hospital in Birmingham, Alabama. I had no idea uh, that Lloyd Nolan was part of this. It was a hospital that was built by the steel industry to service steel workers and their families. You can imagine back in 1922, probably a lot of injuries happened in that factory. Uh, so that hospital was really focused on caring for those patients there. And uh, he was a natural fit to, uh, to be a member of that original committee. We've grown uh, from those original 18 uh, regions and, and uh, we, we now have um, 17 regions throughout the world. So we have an international footprint and the Committee on Trauma, 13 regions in the US and Canada with the 13th being a military region. And then we've uh, added four international regions. And a, a big part of this growth has been our, our education programs, our advanced trauma life support as it's gone and grown and promulgated throughout the, country, throughout the world. Uh, we've added COT chapters in states, provinces, countries around the world. Uh, so it's a, a very large and growing organization, probably about 5,000 regional members. Uh, there's 100 central committee members, the 5,000 throughout the regions uh, around the world. And then if you look at the ATLS, the, what we call the ATLS friends and family, there's a lot of instructors, a lot of course directors, educators involved with that, probably about 20,000 uh, ATLS uh, folks in, the, in that ATLS friends and family. So this is a very large and, and robust organization internationally as well. So just a little bit about our vision and mission. We want to eliminate preventable deaths and disabilities across the globe. Very clear a vision, a mission. We want to implement programs to support injury prevention and ensure optimal patient outcomes across the continuum of care. And that's another concept. It's that continuum of care from prevention all the way through rehab, long-term outcomes, uh, survivorship. We really want to, to cover that whole spectrum with programs that address each of those uh, different areas along the way. So we're lucky we're an organization that really knows our why, right? This is, the, this is what we uh, rally around, uh, this COT family, this tribe that we have has a just cause. And I think that's why we have so many dedicated surgeon volunteers uh, that, uh, that give up their time and effort to make this, to make this work and to, to see this vision uh, become a reality. Uh, we're very blessed in that way. And, and uh, once somebody starts working on the COT, uh, they never want to leave. It's really hard to leave because of the powerful engine that the COT has to make, uh, make significant changes uh, in trauma care throughout the, uh, throughout the world. Uh, so we're very fortunate in that case. So this is a video clip. So when I became, well, when I was membership chair, we were approaching our 100th anniversary and we were planning these big celebrations and, 
and wrote a big book, 300 plus page book on the Committee on Trauma. Uh, I used to have, have to carry that book around and try to sell it to everybody, but I, I'm done with that now. Um, but but one, of the, one of the things I was voluntold was to interview about 40 different previous leaders of the Committee on Trauma uh, over the years. And um, so I've got about 40, 45 hours of, of video of these interviews. Um, and I learned a lot about the Committee on Trauma. There were significant headwinds back in the late 70s, early 80s uh, to some of the things we wanted to do. ATLS, we brought that to the, to the Board of Regents at the college. It wasn't initially accepted. They really didn't know if we needed to get into that area and do that thing. Uh, we developed standards. We developed a verification program in the 70s and 1980. It took six years for the Board of Regents to accept the fact that we needed to verify programs. And Dr. Trunke went up, charged that, charged that pillbox every year during his chairmanship, came back bloodied and bruised and, uh, you know, every time, but we were persistent, okay? So we were sort of known as disruptors in the college back in that day. We have a great relationship with the Puerto Ricans right now. So I don't want anybody to, to say we don't, <laughs> please. Um, but, uh, but this is just some video. You'll see, this is Dave Hoyt talking about uh, a little bit about the culture of the, of the college. Of course, David was a COT chair. He was executive director of American College of Surgeons for 12 years from 2010 till just uh, last year. Uh, he talks about, and there's a little snippet from Wayne Meredith who talks about uh, the work of the committee. So I'll just play this, hopefully it'll, it'll work. But this is Dave Hoyt and Wayne Meredith talking about the COT. But that actually doesn't do what we have to work towards the goal. It's a review after us, uh, and the CFT is, is there in, in, in as, as much as any other organization in the college. If you have somebody to take something on that relates to CR guidelines for trauma care in the United States, CFT delivers, and the CFT is one of our leaders. So it's developing reports, it's their assistance and consultation to develop new systems. Or, have, or designating you know, 800 hospitals a year, and we know what they do. And uh, that is very, very difficult. Yeah, yeah. People that get on, people that are on the committee for the committee of trauma aren't coming to site, please. So, so uh, yeah. So, if you're on a committee on trauma, uh, you know, prepare to work, roll up your sleeves, and get some work done because there's a lot of work to do. And, and again, a lot of passionate surgeon volunteers that, that, that happily do that work and we're very fortunate to have them uh, to do that. This uh, busy slide, apologize for that. This is the structure of the Committee on Trauma as it currently stands. Uh, four main pillars that we, that we focus on to, to achieve our mission. Uh, education, of course, uh, quality, systems, advocacy, injury prevention, stop the bleed. Uh, we have surgical specialty committees that, that participate, burn surgery, neurosurgery, orthopedic surgery, and on. And then we have an international injury care committee that really uh, helps us helps focus our global mission uh, throughout the COT. You know, very fortunate to have that. And of course, the regional committees, that's a separate committee. If you're vice chair of the Committee on Trauma, you're actually chair of the regional committees. Uh, it's a little secret, that's probably the busiest job uh, in the COT is managing both the regional committees and also being vice chair. So I'm very pleased to have Warren Dolak helping me out with that. Uh, but this is the structure and we'll just, I'll just spend some, a brief a uh, little bit of time uh, going through these and some of the things that we do. This is all the leaders that uh, uh, program leads, uh, pillar leads that uh, that devote their time and energy to that. So I don't expect you to read all that, but but we have some fantastic uh, leaders. Um, of course, Avery Nathan, who's medical director of our trauma quality programs. Eileen is his previous uh, past chair of COT and Warren is my, my vice chair. Uh, but uh, beyond this, we've got a lot of other vice chairs. Uh, we have a, a program uh, leads, work group leads, um, you know, again, hundreds of 100 plus committees that uh, really make up the COT. And of course, the secret sauce to all this is the staff, right? So back in the late 70s, early 80s, when we were making all these changes and really transforming what we did in the COT, we had two staff. Now we have about 50, okay? So we've grown the education programs, we've grown the quality programs, we've grown all these programs I'm going to talk about but we need a fantastic staff. And this is a very talented, very passionate. Uh, they work hard every day to make, make us look good. Uh, all their ideas that, uh, uh, you know, that they, they bring to the table uh, really make us look good in the long run. So very pleased to have this uh, wonderful staff that really make this whole engine 
run. Um, okay, so just to, to briefly about some of the pillar areas that we have. Uh, probably most of you have taken an advanced trauma life support course over time, yeah. So, so advanced trauma life support course uh, is um, a COT educational, probably our flagship program uh, that everybody uh, is aware of. It uh, started back, really became a college program uh, back in 1980. Uh, we developed the first manual back then. We're now on version 10 of the course, working on version 11. So there are revisions, <clears throat> there's version 11 with a projected date probably in the fall of 2024 uh, to be released. Uh, it is promulgated worldwide. Uh, we just finished a promulgation in Ethiopia. We're beginning a promulgation right now in Bulgaria. Uh, so it's been caught in at least 112 countries. Uh, at its heyday, about 3,500 courses per annum and about 70,000 students per annum. Probably about 50,000 now. We're still recovering from the pandemic. Um, we gave extensions to people where they didn't have to recertify for another year. So this is the year that's going to come due. So we expect that the, those numbers to, to go back up to what they were before. Uh, but really, advanced trauma life support really started our um, entry into uh, trauma education and really has uh, taken off worldwide. We have other courses, surgical skills courses. Many of you probably have taken Adam. I know you teach that here. Asset, you also teach here. Uh, our surgical skills course best as well. They have an international footprint as well as ATLS. Uh, so a large and growing number of those courses are being taught. We have a rural trauma team development course, which is really focused on the rural areas. This really isn't so much of a course, but it's also it's, it's really about developing relationships between the larger centers, some of the more major trauma centers and some of the more rural trauma centers uh, to develop those relationships so it makes, uh, makes the care of the, the patient a lot easier. DMEP course is also taught here. You know, Dr. Desai, a long time. Uh, and then we just, Susan Briggs had an advanced disaster medical response course that she took worldwide. Uh, this is more of a pre-hospital, out-of-hospital type of a response course. She's gifted that to the college. Uh, we're now developing the, uh, the modules for that so it can be uh, taught uh, as a course in the college. And of course, TEAM is really the leading lead course to HLS. And then Stop the Bleed, which, uh, you know, unfortunately came about from the uh, 2012 uh, uh, Sandy Hook uh, disaster um, has now taught over two and a half million people that we know of the document. It's probably many, 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 many more have received this. Uh, and I know California has been very active to stop the bleed, stop the bleed advocacy, uh, have uh, had a lot of bills passed to support uh, stop the bleed and make sure the kids are out there. So we have some advocacy priorities. You know, the college is an advocacy organization. They have a, uh, they actually have a a headquarters in Washington, D.C., which is the stone throws from the Capitol. Uh, so they do a lot of advocacy work uh, at the federal level. Of course, a big push right now is our NTEPs, which I'm going to talk about. Uh, Mission Zero, which is really uh, inserted into the Pandemic All Hazards uh, Preparation Act uh, to support military civilian uh, collaborations across the country. Uh, they just, uh, we had two, we finally got $2 million appropriated for that. That was uh, uh, given out to, I think, 28 centers uh, received funding for that. Uh, in the uh, omnibus bill, which just passed in December, that amount was increased to $4 million. Uh, so we're hoping to get more money in the future. Uh, it's been, it, it was set up to as $11.5 million is the, sort of the cap, and that's kind of what we're shooting for. Uh, so uh, we've had a lot of great um, uh, advances with our advocacy with missions here. Prevent Bleeding Act is another uh, along the stop the bleed lines. Firearm injury research and legislation. We didn't have any money, federal money for, for firearm injury research for a long time. Um, there was the Dickey Amendment, which prevented that from happening for years. Uh, we advocated very hard. We, we testified in Congress. Um, and uh, eventually now we have $25 million uh, split between the NIH and the CDC uh, for firearm injury research. We're asking for about 60 million dollars is, is uh, as the ne next ask. So that money is being distributed and now hopefully informing our firearm injury uh, prevention efforts uh, with that research. Bipartisan Solution of Cyclical Violence Act to support hospital-based violence intervention programs, uh, very important to us as we, uh, as we try to take this public health approach to firearm injury uh, to develop those, uh, those programs across the country. Medicare physician cut payment cuts is not just a trauma issue, it is a health 
Uh, we've had 2% cuts, I think two separate 2% cuts in the last year. Uh, one of the problems that we have, and I, I have that surgeons pack on there, uh, of the fellows in the American College of Surgeons, less than 1% contribute to the surgeons pack. Now that's way below other medical organizations across the country. So when Congress looks at that, they, they look at an organization that's not really that politically active. So when they make these cuts, you know, they don't, they, there's no political retribution to them. So every time we talk, we always talk about try to support the surgeons pack. It's very important to do that. Uh, so that sends a clear message to Congress that we are uh, paying attention, that we care, uh, and that we, uh, we wanna see, um, we wanna see different uh, action taken when it comes to physician payment cuts. Surgeon's voice, uh, there's a QR code. I, I found this, uh, I have this new tool now, to put QR codes in my talks, right? Everybody's doing it. So that's a QR code, the surgeon's voice. So it's very easy to advocate uh, through surgeon's voice. If you follow that link, it'll take you right to the website. You put in your address, it pulls up a list of your Congress people and your senators, and they're pre-populated uh, letters for the, for the issues that you care about. You can just click. It's like three clicks and a letter sent to your Congress and your legislators in your area. So a great tool to, to, to be politically active, advocate. Dr. Doucette, if you have any questions about advocacy, he was like the, he was the ACS Advocate of the Year in 2020. So if you want to learn how to be an advocate, there's a great resource right here uh, in your own uh, department. So, um, so please check that out. At the state, Stop the Bleed is, uh, we have Stop the Bleed legislation in seven states. It really should be more. This is, this is something that opens a lot of doors. This should be an easy win. California has been very successful. Uh, they've got new legislation, which is going to reinforce that. Uh, which hopefully will be passed, but seven states, we should have, we should have more than seven states. So that's really a focus of our state advocacy uh, in the Division of Advocacy and Health Policy at the college. So those are some of those priorities. Firearm injury prevention. Uh, this is sort of our approach to do this. This was the brainchild of Ronnie Stewart, Deb Cools, Eileen Bolger really, really pushed this as well and refined it. Uh, we have a, a consensus approach. It's a public health approach. We want to implement violence prevention programs. We want to we want a forum for civil dialogue around the goal of moving forward a consensus regarding interventions aimed at reducing firearm injuries and deaths. Uh, and so we're trying to find that common American na narrative. I mean, this is a very polarizing issue. If we can find some common ground, come up with common sense solution. And those recommendations on the right hand side are from our firearm strategy team, a group of firearm owners, non firearm owners, which came up with 13 common sense recommendations that were approved by consensus of the entire group and put forward. Um, says uh, journal uh, in Jax to, if you wanna read more about the uh, FAST work group and some of the uh, FAST recommendations that have been put forward. So this, the, we've had a very busy year, active year in, um, in the, 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 the uh, arena of firearm injury prevention. Uh, after the Buffalo shootings, the Uvalde uh, shootings, uh, we put out a statement from the college uh, that did not, was not well received, that was followed quickly by organizing a press conference at the Washington, D.C. office, where Dr. Turner, who's the new executive director of the college, Dr. Bolger and Ronnie Stewart, who are both previous uh, chairs of the COT, Pat Bailey, who's the medical director of the Division of Advocacy and Health Policy, and myself, uh, talked about uh, firearm injury prevention. Uh, we highlighted the 13 recommendations of the FAST team, uh, and uh, this, was, uh, this was well publicized, well received. Uh, uh, two days later, we had the Bipartisan uh, Safer Communities Act, which was passed. Uh, we, 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 we know it wasn't directly related to the press conference, but we hope it helped uh, spread the message and spread the word about uh, firearm injury prevention. Obviously, the bill didn't go far enough. We got a lot of work to do, but it's at least, at least something right, of getting some traction maybe uh, in this realm as we move, uh, as move this forward. We then followed that with a uh, summit, the second medical summit on firearm injury prevention, five leading uh, medical organizations, including us, uh, American College of Emergency Physicians, uh, American Academy of Pediatrics, along with a couple of others, met again at the AC office in, ACS office in Chicago, uh, put together a, a, a two-day program uh, and then um, had about 46 other medical organizations join us in Chicago for this, for this uh, summit. 
Uh, and uh, we just published the proceedings from that summit, QR code, open access, free to download. Uh, if you wanna learn about what, the, what came from that summit, the main thing that came out of the summit is that we now have a commitment to working together uh, moving forward and to pushing some of these initiatives, health profession education, our advocacy policy initiatives, which will then be supported by multiple organizations at once, uh, professional engagement for firearm safety and community-centered approach to violence prevention, looking at some of the uh, social determinants of health as well, trying to address those and improving uh, the effects of uh, firearm injury uh, violence. So uh, proud to get those out. And then we're working on MOUs to formalize this relationship and there'll be more work to be done uh, in four different work groups uh, moving forward in these areas. We also uh, led the way in developing standards. I talked about 1976, we developed our first standards for trauma centers. Uh, this was quickly followed by a revision in 1979, which put the focus on the patient, optimal resources for the care of the center, it's optimal uh, resources for optimal outcomes. Uh, for the patient. Uh, this has undergone several revisions. Uh, we now have uh, a new, uh, brand new standards document, uh, which we'll start using in September of this year for verification of trauma centers. A lot of new updates, one of them being needing some type of disaster management course. Hopefully DMAP is required to, to get approval as a, as a uh, verified trauma center. Uh, fought uh, for several years get these programs. We were the first, we should celebrate that. We were the first verification program in the college. There are now, I think, nine different verification programs in the college and quality is a major area, major area of focus in the college. So uh, we should be proud of ourselves in the trauma world for really pushing that and, uh, and making sure that that uh, got instituted. We have um, in our verification program, which started in 1987 in, in, in earnest, 581 verified trauma centers. In our TQIP benchmarking program, quality program, we have 889 centers. Uh, so a lot, of, a lot of centers. So with 581 verified trauma centers, we verify, re-verify every three years. That's about one every other day, one center every other day that we're verifying on the Committee on Trauma. So if you want to be a site reviewer, uh, just raise your hand. I'm sure they'll welcome you with open arms uh, to help with all this, uh, all this work that we're doing. And we still haven't reached saturation. We've got great uh, opportunities or level three centers to really push TQIP as well as verification uh, for those programs. Uh, also in quality, performance improvement, patient safety, uh, we put out a, a series of best practice guidelines. Uh, we just put out the mental health and substance abuse uh, guideline. We're working on a revision to the geriatric trauma guidelines. And then we got three others coming in, in traumatic brain injury, urology and chest wall injury. But that QR code will take you uh, to the entire catalog of our best practice uh, guidelines. Uh, it, it, that we've uh, put out. We have an annual TQIP meeting probably next to the Clinical Congress. It's the, it's the second largest uh, meeting that the, that the uh, ACS puts on. Over 2,000 registered participants just had the last one back in Phoenix uh, in uh, December, uh, well attended uh, and uh, really highlights the, uh, the great work that our quality programs do in trauma. It's a really a great think tank. We have a lot of tra trauma program managers, trauma medical directors sharing their ideas uh, sharing uh, what they've, uh, their accomplishments uh, with, with others. So it's really a, a fantastic conference. We have an EMS committee uh, in our trauma systems group. Uh, they put out a series of multidisciplinary consensus papers. We developed field tri triage guidelines. Uh, we revised those guidelines uh, back in 2022, the first revision in 11 years. And now the CDC defers to these guidelines for field triage. So they are the uh, they are the benchmark for, for trauma field uh, gu guidelines, uh, and uh, those have been, been recently published. Trauma systems, uh, we do evaluation and planning uh, for trauma systems. 50 state and regional systems have had consultations since the beginning of the program in 1999. We have about five others which are in line to, to be, uh, be reviewed uh, over the next uh, year, so a very active program. Uh, we have a new white book which outlines trauma system elements, and then that we developed this blueprint for the National Trauma and Emergency Preparedness System, which I'm gonna talk about here in a little bit. So priorities moving forward, we wanna strengthen our core programs in quality and education. If anybody is, is a trauma medical director, uh, you've seen these TQIP reports, uh, they're static, they're PDFs, you can't interact with them, you can't drill down, do anything with them. So we're gonna, we just got funding from the Board of Regions to really look at this and, and, and develop business intelligence and analytic tools 
so that the end user can drill down into these reports and, and, and they're, they're a lot more functional. We're also gonna try to get, a goal is to get to more real-time benchmarking. Right now, they're about six months in arrears. So we wanna try to, to really improve the, the core quality programs. And then really do an evaluation of our education programs and make sure we're, uh, we're on the cutting edge of our educational offerings. Uh, we need to build a bigger tent in the membership. Uh, probably uh, we need to make sure that uh, all trauma care providers are included uh, and have an opportunity to participate in the COT, look at global expansion, talked about MTEPs, and then really a focus on rural trauma, trauma and under-resourced areas. There's a lot of uh, patient movement, I think, uh, to the, the major trauma centers. Uh, we really need to focus, again, on trauma care in the community for those patients who don't have major, uh, major trauma. Uh, I think uh, we've lost some of that over time, and so we've uh, come up with a game plan to sort of address that moving forward. So when I asked the 40 uh, people that I interviewed, what is, the, what, what is the priority that the COT leadership should be focused on, uh, there was a pretty consistent answer. So you're going to see Bill Schwab. Uh, you're going to see David Richardson. There's Bill Schwab. We continuously ask the leadership of the COT and the American College to go back to that zero per member death paper and look at that, create one system for one nation, create opportunities to benefit from partnerships at the federal level and the regional and local level with the military, but more importantly, uh, to use that partnership, that amalgamation, to once again drive forth the real recommendation of the GTD report, which is to create a national and federally based agency that actually is looking at and I'm looking to find ways to stimulate the development of better more uniform policy across the United States. In the interest of time, I'll stop there, but I've got about 30 minutes of that. People talking, past leaders talking about the need for a national trauma system. So, so something that, that again, is, is, is been an aspirational goal of us for a long time. What is a trauma system? Well, it's really, you know, it's, it's really a system that's not, it's not really focused on the center. It's focused on the system. Uh, there are some, some key elements, some key themes throughout a continu the continuum of care from prevention all the way through rehab and post rehab care. Uh, and recovery, all injured patients, not just the major trauma patients. It's a system set up to take care of all injured patients. There's coordination of care, and it's not just, again, focused on the level one trauma center. It's all multi multiple facilities, uh, being able to take care of all injured patients, disperse those throughout the system so that the tra major trauma centers are not overloaded uh, with all trauma. They don't have the capacity to take care of all trauma. You really need to level load across the system to make sure that the sicker patients are getting to the major trauma centers. Uh, and other facilities participate to take care of some of the lower acuity patients in the system. This is Don Trunkey chair from 1992 to 1986 uh, within the uh, executive committee reports uh, from, the, from, the, uh, uh, from the COT executive committee. Uh, he produced this whenever he was uh, the chair of the COT. And he said, although we have islands of excellence, there's that thing again, islands of excellence, we do not have a countrywide system of trauma care with designated verified level one, two and three centers. And the second, second piece is key. The second problem is basic contention that we will never have a meaningful disaster program until we have a viable working trauma network. We will never have a meaningful disaster program until we have a viable working trauma network that does day-to-day -day activities. In other words, keep the motor running and warm so they can surge whenever we have a national disaster, right? We don't have that right now. We just had a national pandemic and that response was not well coordinated. Some areas, again, Islands of Excellence did very well and we'll talk about that, but we need a system across the country that can do uh, that type of care and coordination. Uh, this is Brent Eastman, uh, again, uh, talking about, he really was the father of trauma systems and really pushing that to the college and nationally developed the trauma system evaluation and planning committee. Uh, he talks about uh, in this clip, and I'm not going to show it, we're a little short on time, but he talks about, you know, his regret that he didn't push on this harder. This was 30 years ago, him talking about doing this, wanting to do this. Again, we need to get this, we need to get this done. We can. He did give a scutter oration. 
The Scott Oration is one of the highest honors in trauma surgery. Uh, it is a college oration. Uh, he gave this back in 2009. And, and uh, the title of this talk was Wherever the Dart Lands Toward the Ideal Trauma System. Uh, the story behind this was he, when he testified to Congress or he talked to legislators, he wanted, he wanted a vision uh, to be. So his vision was he's standing in front of a map, closes his eyes and throws a dart. and basically says, wherever that dart lands, if I'm injured where that dart is, I should have access to, to high quality trauma care. And that just doesn't exist right now. And he went through all the justification for that, showed all the data as to why we have these huge gaps in trauma care and they still exist uh, to this day. So we have sort of a traditional approach to uh, improving access. Um, we have uh, from 2005, this study that, you know, this is the areas within 60 minutes of, of access to a major trauma center or uh, trauma care, uh, 2005, 2022. The maps may be a little bit better right now, but it looks pretty much the same over that uh, period of time. I know in Alabama, uh, we've gone to from about 54% of the population to having access within 60 minutes to about 45% over that same time period. So we're losing capacity within, within Alabama. And I don't, think we're, I don't think we're unique in that. This is a heat map, basically, of uh, 2015-20, age of death, death rates, uh, all injury, all intents, all races, ethnicities, both sexes and all ages. Heat map, the, the darker the color, the worse off you are. Uh, so uh, you should... Uh, Congratulate yourselves. You look pretty good in California. <laughs> if the rest of the country looked like that, we would we have made the significant progress. In my home state of Alabama, we have some work to do, uh, right? So there, there's a lot of states across the South uh, and the and Midwest here that, that have uh, work to do and out here. So uh, we've got a lot of work to do. So again, islands of excellence and a sea of chaos. This, I borrowed this slide from, um, uh, from a, 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 a we did a trauma system consultation in, uh, uh, in Georgia. Dennis Ashley, who runs the Georgia Trauma Commission, used this. This quote is from uh, uh, Jay Patrick O'Neill, who works in the, in the University of Georgia uh, Center for Disaster Medicine. Uh, we have this islands of excellence and a sea of chaos. Multiple people saying the same thing, recognizing the same thing, saying the same, using the same analogy. Uh, so we need to address the gaps. In my own system in Alabama, uh, we have three uh, level one trauma centers. Uh, ours is the only ACS verified trauma center in Birmingham. Uh, we have uh, two level twos and a level three that actually have a trauma service that's specifically formed to take care of trauma patients. Those blue dots, uh, they're on the state. They're like level three centers. And I use air quotes, level three centers. Uh, the problem is we don't have a level four designation in Alabama. They're essentially level four centers. They don't have, they really don't have a consistent surgical coverage at these centers. They will not admit patients who are injured if they need admission. They will see patients, they will screen them. If they need admission, they're transferring those patients out. So we had 14,000 patients entered into our Alabama trauma system in 2020, 69% direct, transferred directly to one of those black dots on the map uh, and 4,500 distributed throughout the level threes. And about half of those who went to level threes got secondarily transferred to one of our trauma centers. So in the end, about 83% were eventually cared for in a major trauma center. That's not an inclusive trauma system. Okay, everything's coming to the major trauma centers, not being dispersed out. We don't. We have a lot of patients being traveling a long ways away uh, to get care that they probably could receive at the local hospitals. They're not getting advanced care. They don't need the resources of a level one center. So uh, we need better engagement. Uh, we need better services. Uh, we need uh, more capacity uh, and a need to load balance our patients across the state. This is my center in... Birmingham, Birmingham, y'all, Birmingham, uh, 6,700 trauma evaluations last year. Birmingham, that, that's, we're not New York or Houston or San Diego, we're Birmingham, right? So in 2004 uh, to 2011, we increased from 3,000 to 4,000. It took another eight years from get to 4,000 to 5,000. It took about 12 months to get from five to six. And now we've gone from six to almost seven in the last year. Uh, so, and I don't think, I don't think our population in Birmingham has exploded that much. Uh, we, we, we know that the firearm violence has increased. We see about 1300 gunshot wounds a year in our, in our center, which is just amazing to me. Uh, but I think a lot of it is we have a lot of patients that are now just coming to us that didn't come to us before. A lot of transfer, we know our transfers have increased over time. So last year we, we saw about 2094 total transfers. 
of those transfers, 16% were discharged home from the ED. Some of them flown in from these rural areas, right? So if you think about a rural county, uh, you're working in the ED there, your emergency medicine provider in an ED there, uh, they have one ambulance for the county. So you gotta make a decision. Do I send that one ambulance 150 miles north to Birmingham or south to Mobile uh, to deliver this patient? Or do I bring in a helicopter and fly them out so I can keep that vehicle close by? These are, these are the decisions that we're putting some of these providers in, right? And then patient gets here, discharged home, now they have a large air medical transport bill. Uh, so there's a, there's a real problem uh, uh, in this arena. 27% were admitted for less than 48 hours, no operative intervention. Uh, so about 900 patients came to us, which could be a potentially avoidable transfer. I don't wanna say unnecessary because obviously logistics may have said it's necessary, uh, but potentially avoidable if we can, if we can round out this, this uh, make, make our trauma system more inclusive and get more level three as a function at a high level in the state, we might be able to address that. So real quickly on MTEPS, I know we're going over. We have an unfinished trauma system. I've talked about that throughout the, 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 this morning. Trauma center distribution is driven by market, market forces. We've got poor cooperation between healthcare systems and places where access exists, quality and continuity varies widely, and disaster preparedness is not a priority. Again, we need a national trauma system so we have a good national disaster preparedness system. Uh, we have challenges. We've known about these challenges for a long time. Seven reports over the past 50 years from, from uh, Institute of Medicine. Uh, the last one was from the National Academy of Science, Engineering, and Medicine, talking about the gaps in trauma care in the country. Over 50 years, seven reports documenting the same thing. We haven't made much progress. So it's time to make progress. Uh, we need federal leadership. We need federal funding to do this. Military civilian collaborations are growing uh, and, are, and have been funded, which is great. We need better state collaboration, interstate collaboration and we need a national trauma research plan, which is being put together. Uh, our vision, really equitable access for all injured. We got about 30 million plus patient, people across the country that don't have access to trauma care uh, within a reasonable amount of time. And we need to oversee coordination and, and, and resource and patient casual distribution in daily and mass population and defense. Again, build that system so that we can uh, surge to, to handle any mass casualty event, disaster response, pandemic, what have you. Again, trauma is the thing that's gonna keep the motor running and warm so we can quickly respond to these, these types of events. So we need this national trauma system. COVID was a motivator for change. It really highlighted the fact, you know, Trunky said it 40 years ago, we gotta have a national trauma system, be able to plus up disaster. We didn't have that. And the COVID response was discoordinated in a lot of places. Um, so uh, a lot of opportunity there, a lot of deaths could have been prevented had we had the system in place. Um, so uh, a, a motivator to really drive change. And now some of the federal agencies are, are understanding this and are working on it. And this is why this might be the time for us to get a national trauma system. There were some pockets of excellence, islands of excellence. Uh, Washington State uh, really uh, did a good job, developed a regional coordination center. I had a lot of cooperation from the Department of Health the hospital association, executive leadership, hospital systems got together and really worked. That's gonna be the key to these things, really getting together, being able to work together to a common goal and for the patient good and not driven by, mark, by the market, right? We have to get to that level uh, here to be able to be successful. Concept developed by our, one of our regulatory agencies, Health and Human Services for the Administration for Strategic Preparedness and Response, which is now on par with the CDC. Got a lot of funding. I think a lot of this in response to the COVID response. Uh, so they, they, we want to build a better system. Uh, this is the concept of a medical operation coordinating cell or center or an RMOC, uh, which is really the basis for our NTEPS proposal is to develop these RMOCs across the country. Don't replace those that are working well, but try to fill in those gaps with these regional medical operation co coordinating centers to make sure that patients can get to the right level of care in the right amount of time and load level across the system uh, so that we have, uh, we have better outcomes and don't overwhelm our trauma centers. A lot of advantages to MOX, minimal startup time for large scale events, especially if you have it running day to day through a trauma system, uh, reduced friction at time of need, hospital level, coordination transport, and then uh, managing resources. This is our blueprint. These are some of the elements of the blueprint. This is uh, currently being moved forward. ASPR, now it's an administration 
uh, for strategic response, preparedness and response. In response to the COVID, they're trying to build a national special pathogen system. So there's a lot of organizations working for trauma. They're trying to build a, 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 a pathogen response, a pandemic response uh, system. But we're saying kind of the same things, right? Components of NSPS seamlessly interlocked to provide a coordinated national approach to preparing for health emergencies. So the US has a tiered capable system that coordinates national expertise, capabilities, state and sub-state healthcare capacity across the budget. Doesn't sound like what I'm talking about with the national trauma system. Yeah, it's the same thing. So we've been having communication with ASPR about this. They just submitted a report to Congress that included components of our NTEPS blueprint. Uh, so maybe we're making some headway and, and trying to come up with a common language around all this. The military also, they're working on a coordinated response. We're talking, they're preparing for peer-to-peer -peer conflict, which means that we're going to have a large-scale military operation with a lot of casualties, sometimes projected to maybe 3,000 a day coming back to the United States. And scary to think about. I hope it never happens, but you you. you Prepare for the worst, right? Which is what they're preparing for. Uh, you'll see their plan includes uh, VA facilities. Um, I don't know if that's really the, so we're having some discussions about that with them. Uh, that may not work for trauma care, um, but you're gonna need more than NDMS facilities. You're gonna need the entire civilian network, I think. But again, if you have a national trauma system that can help coordinate some of this level loading across the entire United States for these casualties coming back, uh, from uh, large-scale military operations. Again, God forbid it happens, hope it never does. But again, we're all talking the same thing. We all need the same thing. So we're hoping we can get to develop a common language. So that's why I think the time is now. A lot of, a lot of different agencies, federal agencies are working on this. Uh, we've got a legislative approach. We've developed a blueprint. We have legislative text, which is being written by consultants in our Division of Advocacy and Health Policy. It's gonna be circulated on Capitol Hill to test the waters and see what kind of feedback and response we get. Um, and we're building a coalition of other organizations within uh, medical care uh, to support this and hopefully use their advocacy efforts as well to push this concept. We're also taking that regulatory approach, common language among ASPR, among the military, among us. We're all saying the same thing. Hopefully somebody will actually listen uh, so that if, if it's gonna benefit all of us, we might be able to get a system in place that does benefit all of us for all these different emergency responses that we need. So we're having discussions with ASPR, with the Northern Command of the military and our National Disaster Medical Response System to see if we can come up with a common language and a common approach to this so we can move this forward. And then we're also in the background working on standards. You know, we develop standards for trauma centers. We want to develop standards for our box so that when, if we're fortunate and get this approved, we can say, here are the standards and we can verify these things, right? We do that, right? We've done that with trauma centers. We wanna do it for these, for these RMOCs as they stand up as well. So we're working on that in the background. Okay, I'm done. Sorry, I went over a little bit. I apologize. Um, this is my crew back at UAB. Uh, we have a faculty of 24 uh, that uh, care for our uh, trauma patients. Um, and uh, they, uh, they're the ones who allow me to go out and do this uh, non-paying job uh, that I do that I love so much. So I always have to give uh, thanks to my faculty back home uh, in Birmingham. And with that, I will stop. And I appreciate your attention and I appreciate the opportunity to, to be here with you today. Thanks very much, Jeff. I think we can take a few questions. Any questions for us, Dr. Wood? Sure. Very well balanced, and we're very supportive. So, with 